See you, Victor. Karibu Nadia. You're welcome. Karibu Nisan. Always a blessing to have you. We are almost just about to begin. Wonderful, wonderful. We thank God for his greatness and his mercies that are ever new every morning. Uh, well, welcome. I'm glad to have each one of you come on board uh, even today as we continue with our lunch, our program. Every day from Monday all the way up until Friday, we'll be doing an online lunch hour over this entire season. So I'm excited just to be uh, with you and I'm I'm so excited mostly because I have a word from God to speak to you and I know that that word will generate results in your life. Uh, so again, welcome. My name is Reverend Pancras Ngira and it's always exciting to have you being on board. To all of you that are coming on, uh, please find the liberty just to go ahead and also share, share this link. Uh, do your best to also comment as much as you can as you're being blessed and also participate uh, with your write-ups. Uh, tag a friend if you can be able to do so. Let as many people as can be able to come in, come uh, come online and also be blessed uh, by the word of the Lord even as we are kicking on. I'm excited to see every one of you definitely. Uh, Pastor Sandy, my daughter, I can see you. Pastor Margaret, I've seen you. And every other person, Nadia, uh, Vicky, always being the first one to open up. Uh, our gatherings, Karibuni Sana. So let's keep on uh, gathering in. We want just to start off and I will go straight into the word uh, so that we can be able to uh, have sufficient time to build on what God has been speaking to us uh, throughout this entire, God has been speaking to us from yesterday and what we are going to be building on uh, as we continue throughout this entire week. I'm in the book of Psalms chapter number 23, Psalms chapter 23, I'm in verse number 6. Psalms 23 and verse number 6 is where I'm at right now. Uh, and I want just to read the scripture. And then we're going to pray and immediately get into the word. Uh, and I will give further direction even as we continue. Psalms 23 and verse number 6. All of you know this psalm. It's a common psalm uh, that has been uh, used many a times whenever people are actually in places of distress, discouragement, uh, or even in need of direction, most of the times the people usually get into this psalm, they get into it making confession so that God can be able to bring an answer to them. Verse number 6 basically says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Now, from yesterday, I began to speak on a message I've entitled, The Followings of the Saint. The followings of the saint. They are things that are assigned to follow believers. And that's what I've actually been speaking on. And I made an introduction yesterday. I want to continue on and I just want to go deeper uh, into the same. So let's pray even as we begin. Lord, we want to thank you for this opportunity of getting into your word. And we want to thank you because, Lord, you will speak to us. We pray that your word will come forth profoundly, uh, yet clearly. Lord, we believe you that, God, this word will make an impact in the lives of your people. And I'm committing each one uh, that is coming online right now and those that are already here and those that will watch even after. 
culture that let this word be a word that will edify them will build them will uh, bring prophetic results into their lives and will move them to their next level in life so lord receive praise in advance for what you're doing right now in jesus precious name amen and amen and amen well welcome and uh, it's exciting to have each one of you <clears throat> like i said from yesterday that we are going to be doing our lunch hours uh, online as per this time we've been doing it both on site and online uh, but as a ministry we've taken a bit of a change uh, in terms of venue uh, we've actually moved into our own property we are still working on certain modalities and so in the meanwhile we're just going to be majoring on doing the program online and i trust that even with this we are still going to be blessed even as we began off. Uh, thank God for social media which opens up uh, uh, this platform so that we can be able to uh, have an opportunity for people to receive an impartation without walls of limitation. In fact, one person once said that 2020, in as much as it brought in a lot of pain because people lost their jobs, uh, families were affected, uh, companies were closed down, several things happened apart from people even dying, uh, which was one of the most challenging seasons we ever had. It also was a blessing in disguise in that it opened up the nations and the church by itself became a church without walls. And so we thank God that God has been able to permit social media to open up so that we can be able to reach out to people from wherever point that we can and be able to speak to them. So the title of my message again, like I started off yesterday, is the followings of of the saints the followings of the saints and that's what I'm speaking on when I began yesterday I spoke about certain things that happen to people when they get into a new season three critical things the first one is the importance of knowing the things that ought to fall into place the second thing is the things that ought to be active in your present moment the third thing is that it's very important for a believer to always be conscious or to be aware of the things that are assigned to follow them as believers. I cracked a joke yesterday and I was explaining, you know, I like watching this comedian called Mark Angel. Uh, he always blesses me. And uh, somewhat I remember when he was, uh, every time they keep on doing that program, there's a point where he reaches and he always makes a statement. He says that unless somebody is following you from your village, maybe that's why you may not actually be able to succeed. That word following you is what constantly captures my attention. And one of the things that we have to understand as believers or even as human beings is that there will always be certain things that will follow us. These things are what we consider as commanded results or things that command results as we make progress in our own personal lives. And as believers, God has assigned that there are things that should always follow us, that every time we make progress or we are ever moving, whether we are finishing a day, whether we are concluding a week, whether we are concluding a month, whether we are concluding an year, when we're supposed to be taking stock or uh, 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 you know, stock over the things of uh, what may have happened over that period of time, we should be able to testify that there are certain things that happened to us simply because we had these things that followed us. And uh, we were able to look at five things that are, are commanded by God to follow the believer uh, in Psalms chapter number 23 and verse number 6. The first one is goodness. Uh, the second one is mercy. Psalms 23 and verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. So the first thing that God assigns is goodness. Second thing is mercy. And then we also went ahead to look at Mark 16 and verse number 17. Uh, the Bible says, This sign shall follow them that believe. And we broaden the word signs there uh, using the book of Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 22. Uh, in Acts 2, 22, it talks concerning Jesus. It says, And God approved Jesus with signs, wonders, and miracles. Signs, wonders, and miracles. So uh, when you look at the scriptures, then you will understand that these are the five things. One, goodness. Secondly, mercy. Thirdly, signs. Number four, wonders. And number five, number six, and number five, rather, uh, is what we consider as miracles. The five of these things ought to be the results that pursue a believer. Now, according to the statements of Jesus in Mark 16, 17, uh, he basically was simply trying to tell us that as believers, therefore, we ought not to look for signs and wonders. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we ought not to be surprised when signs and wonders are also brought into our lives. That's something that we also ought to put into play. Uh, that is to say that unbelievers are the ones to be mesmerized, surprised when they see these things happening. Uh, but to the believer, that must be a normal phenomena that follows after you. So every time you keep on making progress, as long as you've contacted God, these things must happen to you as a believer. So we want today to deal with the two first two, that is in the book of Psalms 23 and verse number six. We want to deal with goodness and we want to deal with mercy, the two of these entities. Tomorrow we are going to go deeper and look at signs and wonders, but right now we will be beginning with the first one, which is goodness and mercy. Now, if God has 
assigned these two entities. The question is why? Why did God assign goodness to follow us? Why did God assign mercy to follow us? Let's start with goodness. Let's start with this aspect of goodness. Now, the word goodness here generates two entities that is very critical in life. The word goodness here, number one, generates the entity of God's nature and presence. Okay? God's nature and presence. Jesus, at one particular time, uh, when one uh, of the young men looked at him wanting to become his disciples, called him good master. And when, the, when this particular young man called Jesus good master, Jesus says, call me not so, for only God is good. Only God is good. So, we then observe that one of the things about God is that he has a good nature and that word good nature is not just, I mean, not just good nature, but also depicting his presence, uh, which is to say that whenever we are talking about goodness, uh, God's goodness in somebody's life, we are talking of God's nature being active in somebody's life and God's presence also being active in the person's life. Uh, the second thing that we observe when the word goodness appears there is the workings of God. So, the first thing that we observe when we talk about good Goodness here, when the Bible says goodness shall follow me, uh, is that we're talking about God's nature being with somebody or God's presence being with somebody. And the second part of it is that we are talking of God's workings being with the individual. Now, God's workings can basically be understood in Genesis chapter number one, uh, when God was creating every time that God would create from verse number three. Uh, in verse number four, after God would create, the Bible says, and God would see and God would say it is good. God would see and God would say it is good. So that is to say that if you want to know that goodness is following you, uh, it, it simply <clears throat> means that the workings of God are active in your life. So every time a day comes into conclusion, you can attest to the fact that indeed God is good. Why? Because good things became revealed or manifested in your own personal life. Now look at Psalms chapter number 103. Psalms 103. And let's build up. Again, if you're coming online, take the liberty to share this program. Let people be blessed and let them also be edified. Look at Psalms 103. Look at this scripture <clears throat> that David actually speaks on as he's praising God. And uh, he speaks a statement in verse number 5. Psalms 103 and verse 5. He says, who satisfies my mouth with good things. So God satisfies me with good things. Then he explains, so that my youth may be renewed like an eagle. All right? So that my youth may be renewed like the eagle. So which means uh, for somebody to feel renewed or to feel youthful or to feel young or to feel regenerated or, uh, you know, feeling excited afresh in life, it's an indication of the things they are being satisfied with. Sometimes people feel old, they feel tired, they feel emaciated, they feel like they are exhausted and they feel like giving up in life, not necessarily because, uh, uh, because they worked very hard, but simply because they never saw any good thing working in their life. But remember, God himself has given a promise in Psalms chapter number 23 and God makes it very clear that there are things that should follow you and the first one that God makes clear that should follow you is goodness. Now that is to tell you that anytime you do not experience goodness, then you will notice that your life begins to bring you into a position where you feel worn out, you feel exhausted, you feel like giving up and you feel tired. And you have a right, therefore, to demand of God that these good things should begin to follow you. Why? Because if God satisfies you with the good things, then you will feel extremely renewed. You will not make a conclusion of a day and feel weary or exhausted. The conclusion of your day will automatically bring into you reju a rejuvenation. You will feel excited. You will have inventory of the day and be able to testify to people that, look, this is what God has been able to do. That's where the word testimony appears uh, because of things that you can testify of that God himself has been able to do in your life. And so David teaches us very clearly that goodness shall follow you. Goodness shall follow you. And you have to learn to claim goodness in your life. So we've been able to explain that goodness is an expression of two entities of God or two aspects of God. The first one is the nature or presence of God. And the second one is the workings of God. So let's start with God's nature and God's presence in somebody's life. Let's go to the book of Genesis <clears throat> chapter number 39. Genesis 39. Now look at Genesis 39 and look at what God does. Look at the workings of God. We start with, first of all, uh, God's presence rather. Look at the presence of God at work in the life of this individual called Joseph. The Bible says, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, uh, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down 
Peter. So he had been sold as a slave. He was under the hands of Potiphar who had actually bought him. But look at what happens to him. He says, and the Lord was with Joseph. So we see God's presence being with this man called Joseph. And he was a prosperous man. He was a prosperous man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Look at verse number three. It says, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that he made <clears throat> all things that he did to prosper in his hands. So we see the presence of God and we see the workings of God. We see that as long as God was with Joseph, Joseph prospered. And as long as God worked with Joseph, it whatever Joseph involved himself in, it automatically prospered. Now, these are two aspects of God that you have to learn to claim in your life. God's presence or nature and God's workings in your life. You have to learn to claim them in your life. Can you imagine this is in the Old Testament and it explains to us that when God was with Joseph, Joseph was prosperous. Now, this is even enough to try and teach you that prosperity isn't defined by giving only. Prosperity isn't just defined by having money in your life. I I've always had people keeping on preaching and say these are preachers of prosperity, uh, these preachers of prosperity. And I tell people, I think we need to redefine the word prosperity. Uh, prosperity is simply God's presence active in a person's life, enabling them to succeed in whatever they do. That's the simple definition of prosperity. It's a presence of God in a person's life being active and enabling them or empowering them to succeed in whatever they do. Now, that is enough to tell you the importance of God's presence in your own personal life. That as a believer, if there's anything you ought to pray for and believe God for is for the presence of God to be with you because Joseph was a slave. If prosperity is money, then Joseph should not have been prosperous. But prosperity is simply the element of God's presence in an individual's life. I've had people opening up their mouths and say, Pastor, pray for me uh, that they may not fire me or pray for me that they may not lay me off work because they are in the process of laying people off duty and they are cutting off people so that they can be able to because of financial challenges. And I tell people, listen, uh, there's some things that God can do in your life that people can automatically not just fire you. In Joseph's life, by reason of the results he commanded, it was impossible for Potiphar just to wake up and fire him. It was an impossibility because there was something upon Joseph that commanded certain results that were strange in his life. Whatever Joseph involved himself in, there were results. One other person we observe in the Bible is Jacob. When Laban comes to Jacob, Laban testifies. He says, by experience, I have seen God bless me because of you. In other words, Jacob, I don't want to lose you. From the time you came under me, the reason why my company has enlarged, my life has been improved, my destiny has become better is because you have been with me and I have had that experience. But the question is, what happened to Jacob? And the answer is exactly what happened to Joseph. God was with Jacob and God made everything Jacob to do prosper. And that's what I want you to understand. When the Bible says, surely goodness shall follow you, it is talking of God's presence being with you and talking of God's workings being with you. This is something that every believer ought to desire. Whether you're doing business, whether you're doing you're, you're in school, in your academics, whether you're employed, whatever you're involved in, learn to desire the presence of God and learn to desire the workings of God to be active with you and in you. The moment God is with an individual, Individual, things begin to flow and things begin to flourish. One particular time in the Bible, there was an argument amongst the children of Israel as to why Moses had to go ahead and select Aaron, his brother, to become a leader. They felt like Moses was becoming nepo nepotistic. You know, I hope that's good English. I mean, doing nepotism. So they felt like this is a family business. You, your sister is a prophet. Your brother is a priest. You are the leader. Why do you have to select Aaron? And so God told Moses, the best way to prove this matter, to show it uh, that I am with an individual, is simply call all the tribes. Let them select one person who will represent them. And let each one that they will select to represent them have a role. Road. Let the roads be brought and be put in the holy of holies. Now, the one that will bud or produce, that will be the one that will be proven as a mark that I have selected the person. Now, these are dry sticks that each one of them was requested to go ahead and collect. And they picked all of them, brought them and laid them in the presence of God. In the morning, the Bible records, when they all woke up to go and check, they found out that the road of Moses was the one that had budded. That the road of Moses was the one that had generated fruit. Now, let's create an argument here. Number one, these are dry sticks. So that means they are dead and unproductive. Number two, they were not planted on the earth and watered so that they could be able to generate. Can you imagine against all odds, 
something that was very dry still produced fruit. That is to show you that with God, even in the worst of situations, God will still back you up by helping you generate a result. No matter where you are, when God is with an individual, when his goodness is with an individual, things will work. Things will begin to produce. Now, that's why the Bible says goodness will follow you. So that means wherever you go, God's workings are with you. God's presence is with you. And when God is with an individual, the same way he was with Joseph, even as a slave, everything he did prospered. Listen to me. To a believer, every state is still an advantage. The worst is an advantage. The best is an advantage. Why? If God is with them in jail, they will make it. You know, the Bible says of a time when the children of Israel had gone to war with a particular nation. And the Bible records that when they bet that nation, the nation opened up their mouth. They said, it may be their God is a God of the hills. So he has defended them. So let's find a way that we will deal with them in the valley. In the valley, they were beaten. They, oh, the enemy said again, maybe their God is a God of the valleys. You know, somewhat they kept on looking for excuses. Let's find them in the plains. Let's fight them there. Listen, our God is in all levels. In the valleys, he is there. In the hills, he is there. In the plains, he is there. In the light, he is there. In darkness, he is there. As long as God is with you, then his goodness will be revealed that God will make everything you are doing to succeed. So I want to encourage you, stop complaining. The Bible says, surely, goodness. And that word goodness, like, like I've said, has two entities. The word goodness there depicts ent uh, two aspects. Rather, It de depicts the aspect of God's presence and nature, and it depicts the aspect of God's workings in an individual. No matter where you are, God is still with you. And this God has committed himself to make sure that his goodness will follow you. And that means wherever you are, whatever dimension you are, whichever state you are in, you are still advantaged. You are not under a loss. You are not put in a place where you will literally lose. No, even in loss, you are still advantaged. Now, if you look at the life of Joseph, you know, one of the messages that I was actually preparing to minister in Word of Light just this previous Sunday, God just changed my message, though I'll be ministering it in the coming Sunday, is a message entitled Prophetic Winds. Prophetic Winds. And if you check the word wind, uh, in the Greek is the word pneuma. If you look at it in the Hebrew, uh, it's the word zoe, okay? Uh, if you look at the definition of that word wind, it talks of prophetic spirit, prophetic spirit. So that means when winds blow, it's like something moving you from one place into another dimension. And, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to explain to people concerning prophetic winds that there are times in life you will find a wind blowing you to a place you least expect it. And you must, as a believer, at that time, sometimes you have fasted, you have prayed about certain things, but it seems like things are not working as you expected. And then I wanted to explain to people that that's a clear example of like exactly what happened to Joseph had a dream and a vision and instead of things becoming better things were seemingly looking worse imagine you've just dreamt in genesis 37 and you have seen how god is about to elevate you and you only find out that the dream instead makes people more angrier and they even tend to reject you and you thought that it would be make them even love you instead they hate you and instead you find yourself being sold out and you're all of a sudden finding yourself in a strange foreign land and one thing leads to the other you're a slave as a slave, you begin to see God working, and when you think God is in the process of just elevating you, pam, Potiphar's wife appears. You find yourself in jail. And no, what they say is historians open up their mouth. They say, Bible historians, that Joseph served under Potiphar for three years and went to jail for 10 years. What Joseph would have done is to have a negative attitude and tell himself, my God, I am a done fellow. The things God spoke in Genesis 37 would never come to pass. But prophetic winds were taking place because his destiny had nothing to do with Canaan. It had everything to do with Egypt. So even in Egypt, God knew what he was doing. He finds himself a prisoner and then all of a sudden one thing leads to the other that if after 10 years God visits him and God elevates him, God lifts him and God makes sure he will bring it to a place where even his own brothers come and fulfill the prophecy that Joseph had seen several years ago. So I explained to people and I asked them the question uh, that when you see Joseph in Potiphar's house, who was he? He was a slave. But when he went to jail, was he a slave of any person? No, he was not. He was a prisoner of the state. So even in jail, Joseph knew the goodness of God had not left him. So when God brought the season of him to be promoted, and that time Pharaoh called for him, was he a slave of any person? No, he was a prisoner of the state. That means in prison, he was actually a free man. I know you may not understand that, but keep on listening to me. Had it been 
that Joseph interpreted the dream of, uh, of Pharaoh while he was a slave under Potiphar's house, then he would never have been promoted to be the second man in Egypt. But God made sure that he was removed from the hands of Potiphar and he became a prisoner of the state, which indirectly was making him a free man. Some of the things that can happen to you are actually leading you to liberty. You may think that losing the job is the end. It is actually God promoting you to your next level. And that's why I'm saying in every state in life, the goodness of God has been commanded to follow you. I want you to be conscious about that. No matter the warfare around your marriage, around your children, around your health, around your business, around your career, no matter what it is, as long as God is with you, his goodness is with you. And guess what? The goodness of God will always work for your advantage. And David says, surely, number one, goodness will follow me. I prophesy to you, whoever is watching me right now, that may the goodness of God follow you as it has been placed as a command to follow the saint. May his goodness begin to follow your life. May the workings of God and the presence of God become active in your life. Look at this in Acts chapter number 10 concerning even Jesus, that even the words of Joseph, of David rather, in Psalms 23 were realized in the life of Jesus himself, that goodness followed Jesus in Acts chapter number 10 and verse number 38. Look at Acts 10 and verse 38. Look at what he says. He says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. That's the nature of God. Doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. He could not manifest goodness if God was not with him. <laughs> I feel like shouting right there. Beloved, what I'm simply trying to say, and I want you to put it into place, be conscious that goodness will follow you. Anything that does not look good, reject it. Tell yourself, no matter what the enemy will try to preach to me, God has already given a word. Goodness will follow me. So always set it in your head that good things are following my life. Good things are following my life. In fact, one, one, one particular scripture says that God will command his goodness to even go before me. But we are talking about the things that will follow you. And one of the things that God has commanded to follow you is good things. Set your mind on that. When you wake up in the morning, tell yourself goodness will follow me today. By the end of the day, take inventory of the good things that will follow you. When a week begins, set your mind on the fact that this week good things are following me. By the time a new month begins, like the month of June, set yourself. Don't begin to see that you haven't yet paid school fees. They will chase your children. Forget that nonsense. Set yourself. Goodness will follow me in whatever state. Goodness is following my life. May that be your word in Jesus' name. Number two, David says goodness. Then he says, and mercy. So he doesn't just speak about God's goodness following him. He says, and mercy shall follow me. So what is mercy? And this is something that we need to understand. Mercy, number one, is the advocacy of God. It is God's advocacy. Number one. Number two, it is God's intervention. And number three, it is God's intercession. Now, the three of these are under one definition, but I'm just releasing all of them. It is God's advocacy, God's intervention, and God's intercession. God's advocacy, his intervention, and his intercession. So when the Bible says God's mercy will follow you, it means God will stand as an advocate for you. Why? Because the accuser of the brethren will always attempt to attack you. Let me give an example. In Zechariah chapter number 3, there's an account of a vision that Zechariah sees. Zechariah chapter 3. And he says, in a vision, I was able to see Joshua the high priest. And yet I saw the accuser. And on the other side, I also saw an angel of the Lord. The scripture says that the accuser began to speak. But the angel made intercession. Spoke as an advocate and intervened on behalf of. Because the accuser spoke against him. And we see in Zechariah, let's even go there so that we can be able to take account of it. Please stay with me. This will bless you. This will bless you. Like I said again, as you're coming on, do your best to also share. And I trust you're already blessed. And also participate with your comments. Look at what he says. He says, and, I sh and he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan, look at what he says, standing at his right hand to resist him. Now, take note of the fact that the one who is seated at the right hand of God the Father is Jesus Christ. And what is he doing? He's making intercession. But can you imagine Satan also attempted to go to the right hand? That's one of the reasons why whenever you pray, always have different understandings of prayer. Prayer, when we go before God, we go before him as our Father. All right? 
And we know we are approaching him as our father. But we also must understand that any time we go before God in prayer, that we also must see him as a judge because he's an accuser also standing. But God is not just a judge. You will get to understand he's an advocate also. So look at verse number two. The Bible says, and the Lord said unto Satan. Now that is the angel of the Lord. The word angel of the Lord there is also the word Lord. The Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke you. So we see intercession. O Satan, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? So he's saying Joshua has been selected from the fire. He's been refined. I selected him myself. Look at verse number three. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. So that is what the accusation was appearing. So there's an accuser that will always work against us. Verse number four. And he said and spake, and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair matter, matter upon his head. So they set a fair matter upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. So we notice that why the angel of the Lord was there, or the Lord was there, was to make intercession. Remember that mercy is God's advocacy, God's intervention, and God's intercession. Now, intercession is not long prayers of crying for people and saying, oh God, remember. No, no. Intercession is simply making advocacy, standing in between and pleading on behalf of. All right. So when we see the scripture in the book of Zechariah, we see advocacy, we see intervention, and we see intercession. And that's what mercy does. And that's why whenever you read the New Testament, if there's one thing that appears is what we consider as a mercy seat. The mercy seat of God is very, very essential. So let's go to Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse 16. Remember, we are talking of the followings of the saints. And we've talked of goodness as one of the things that follows a believer. Now we are talking of mercy. God has commanded mercy to follow you. And we've said, what is mercy? Number one, mercy is God's advocacy, God's intervention, and God's intercession. So let's go a bit deeper. Let's check it out. Hebrews 4, 16. He says, and approaching the throne of grace... Okay, the throne of grace with boldness. So there's a reason why God tells you approach it with boldness. Then he explains, in order that you may obtain, King James, mercy and receive grace in times of need. So you are approaching a throne. So this is God as a judge. And there are two things you require when you are approaching the throne. The first one you require is to obtain mercy. The second thing you require is to receive grace. So why do you obtain mercy? Because mercy stands as an advocate on your behalf. Mercy stands as an intercessor on your behalf. Mercy stands, number three, as an, in, an intercessor. Okay? So mercy will stand to plead with God and will tell God, remember mercy. And how does mercy stand? It pleads using the blood of Jesus. So which means that every day you wake up, every week you keep on making progress, every month or every new season you're entering, mercy is commanded to follow after you. Why? Because there will always be a case that the enemy will raise against your destiny. There will always be an enemy that will stand to pose as an accuser, an enemy that will mark your steps to find a way to destroy your destiny. Lamentations chapter number 4 and verse number 18. Write it down somewhere. Lamentations 4 and verse 18. The Bible says they have marked our steps so that we may not enter on our streets. Our end is near. Our lives have been cut off. Lamentations 4 and verse 18. They have marked our steps so that we may not walk on our streets. Our end is near our, our and our, we have been cut off. So you will realize that the enemy always, we call the monitoring spirits, have been assigned to monitor your rising, your progress of the day, to make sure that they do certain things to cut you short from moving into your di next dimension. I've had people preach against monitoring spirits and I tell people that while you're preaching so you must understand these things are real. The spiritual world is very real. What hindered Moses from entering the promised land after having walked with God over a long period of time and God himself testifies that he was the meekest man? What is it that hindered him? Just anger. Anger alone. The guy, when God just commanded him, speak to the rock. Instead, in anger that was prompted by the children of Israel or provoked by the children of Israel, picked the stick and hit it. And God just opened his mouth and he said, because you have not sanctified me in the sight of the children of Israel, therefore you will not enter. You will only see it at a distance and you won't enter. This man walked with God for a long period of time. This was just 
quote unquote like the first time he did a mistake and God just said no you're not entering you violated a law you have uh, infringed something so what did Moses need at that time he needed mercy to intervene on his behalf because mercy will always triumph over judgment what triggered him to anger it was an accuser and somewhat because God is legal in his dealings he could not be able to allow more if that would happen then there were very many things that would have happened that the enemy would keep on using against God so God said, now Moses, by reason of this, you can't enter. But what would have Moses required at that time? He needed mercy. If mercy stood up and spoke on his behalf, mercy would have commanded grace to intervene. And grace would have shifted Moses to the next level. That is what the Bible would say in Psalms 102 and verse number 13. Very powerful prayer. He says that God will arise and have mercy upon Zion. Then listen to this. He says, why does God arise and have mercy? He says, for the time to favor her, yet the set time has come. So which means when your time has come, there will always be an enemy that will try to find a way to trap you from entering your destiny. So who do you need to plead your case? You need mercy. Mercy is an entity or the person that comes in to intervene, intercede and become the advocate that will remind God, remember them, because in every progress we make, we may have a bit of faultings there. So that's why David says, mercy shall follow me. You need mercy every day. Mercy renews you. Mercy pleads on your behalf. The Bible says in the book of Romans, it is not him that runs, neither him that wills, but it is he that God shows mercy. Learn to pray that God shows you mercy. They are people that will to do great things. They are people that have set themselves and desire to do great things, but they don't succeed. Tremendously potential, a gifted have a lot of resources. I mean, you can see everything good about them, but somewhat they do not make it. Why? Because it is not him that runs, neither him that wills, but it is God. When God shows you mercy, certain things begin to work on your behalf. Mercy pleads. It becomes an advocate for you. So let mercy follow you. Every morning you wake up, learn to pray, Lord, let goodness follow me. And let not just goodness follow me, let also mercy follow me. Let it be that mercy will arise. Arise, O God, and have mercy for the time to favor me has come. Yea, the set time has come. Let mercy arise. Let it speak for you so that you will never abort your moments. If there is a monitoring spirit looking for a way to trap you or familiar spirits, they won't succeed because mercy stands as an advocate. Number two, what is mercy? Mercy is God's favor. God's favor. Com commanding all laws to be suspended on your behalf. It is a favor of God that commands every law that is working against you to be suspended on your behalf. So it is where God comes in and just decides to favor you. He marks you. He says, I like you. And because I like you, every natural law, every law that should work against you is suspended. So it is pulled away. So because of that, you are now moving to the next level. Moses himself made that prayer in Psalms chapter number 90. If you read Psalms 90 and verse number 14, Moses made a prayer. If you just go study the whole of Psalms 90, Moses laments about the life of a human being. Uh, you know, I've had people keeping on saying that a human being can only live up until 80, that God in the book of Psalms already declared that the uh, age limit of a human being is 90. There's nothing like that. The only time that God declared an age limit for human beings is in Genesis chapter 6. After man had sinned against God, Genesis 6, the Bible says the spirit of God could not strive with humanity. So God set up a standard and God said they can only do up until 120 years. They can go above, but that's what God said. So in Genesis, in Psalms chapter 90 is the first time we observe Moses making a statement of observation. He says a man can live up until 70 to 80 if he is strong. It was an observation he made. Now remember, Psalms has been written by 11 writers. And one of the writers of Psalms is Moses. And Moses specifically wrote the book of Psalms 90. So in his observation, Moses says, I've noticed men live about 70 to 80 years. And it was an observation he was making. And he noticed this because he was leading the children of Israel in their sin, the judgments of God kept on resting on them. And so many of them died around those ages. A few were able to pass, himself included, and also Caleb and Joshua. Now, what I'm bringing about is when Moses looked at it in his statement in Psalms 90, he saw the toil of man, the struggle of man. So he begins to pray from verse 12 in Psalms 90. He says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. He prays in verse number 13. He says how we ask God to show, I mean, God to be with them. And then in verse number 14, he says that God would satisfy them early with mercy, early with mercy. 
Ali with mercy, that they may rejoice and be glad all the day long. Mercy is an entity you ought to pray that will follow you throughout your entire days. Pray it will follow you to work. You will find out that even your haters will love you without you explaining. Your boss who was against you, God will place a command and the strivings of men will be elevated out of you. And even those that don't like you will have to work for your favor because mercy is speaking on your behalf. Mercy is pleading on your behalf. Beloved, listen to me. We need the mercy of God. And I'm praying for you that surely today goodness will follow you and mercy will also become an entity that will become a part of the package that will follow follow after you in the name of Jesus. So Lord, I thank you for every viewer that has tuned in today. Thank you for those that are watching now, those that will watch later, those that have been watching. I declare that God, according to the word you have put in my lips today, I say to each one of them that surely goodness and mercy shall follow them. May this become their realities. May they see the goodness of God working on their behalf. The things that they never thought would be able to be commanded to begin to fall into place will begin to do so today. Lord, may they begin to see your mercy plead on their behalf in the name of Jesus Christ. For it is not him that runs, neither him that wills, but it is God that showeth mercy. Lord, I pray today, show them mercy. Show them mercy in the name of Jesus. Satisfy them early with your mercy and let them begin to see your mercy following them throughout this entire week in their working place, in their businesses, in their classes, wherever they may be in their families. Lord, I decree mercy will follow your people and goodness will follow them in the name of Jesus Christ. May you receive it now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And amen. My God, I'm blessed. I'm blessed as a person. Let me say this to each one of you. Take this word. Consciously work on this. These are things God has commanded to follow you. And if you believe them, then I can see a writing of amen. Somebody can type it there. And may you receive the word of the Lord. May this become your reality. Listen, the word of God works. The Bible says, his word is nigh us. It is in our mouth and it is in our heart. Romans chapter number 10 and verse 5. His word is near us, in our mouth and in our hearts. Let this word that now is near you be in your mouth. Confess what you have just heard today. But beyond that, let this word that you have heard get into your heart. Let it now begin to produce fruit. 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. From today, you will see goodness no matter the state. From today, mercy will plead on your behalf. I declare the blessing of God upon you. Well, if you want to be a blessing, you can be. These are our lunch hour sessions. Uh, it's quite simple. We have a till number uh, that uh, I wish I would have somebody post it there, an MPESA till number that you can be able to utilize just to be a blessing. Uh, the number is 581854. Peter, I can see you there. Peter, you could help me. You could just go ahead and type it for us. Uh, 581854 buy goods and services you can be able to go ahead and communicate your offerings even your tithes if you feel like to be a blessing to this ministry 581854 it will be written word of light you will see it there word of light even in case you're out of the nation and you want to be a blessing you could use wave uh, as one of the ways to be able to communicate so i could give you a number in which you could also be able to use uh, there's a kenyan called plus Two five four plus two five four plus two five four seven two two seven two two five seven two three six three. All right, let me go through that again. Plus two five four seven two two five seven two three six. Peter, you could also help me. You could post it there. I trust that you have been blessed. Before I can make a conclusion, let me pray for your offerings. And also, I would want to pray for people that are watching may probably not be born again or you're backslidden. And you also want me to also pray for you. I speak a blessing over all the offerings and I declare that as you release your seeds, may God multiply it. If you're not born again and you're asking me, man of God, pray for me. I want to receive Jesus or you're backslidden. This is a great opportunity for you to give your life to Christ. So I want you to pray together with me this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I ask you for forgiveness. Please wash me with your blood and forgive me of my sins. Lord, come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. So God bless you. Thank you. 
Please, let's see you again tomorrow on this same platform. And before we can conclude, I also gave an instruction this lunch hour, this entire week, we are actually making prayer for the nation of Kenya. And so you could also join us in fasting and prayer. Just go ahead, pick a day, though we've been doing it for 21 days. Pick a day, join us. Let's believe God for the nation of Kenya. In fact, before I make a conclusion, I want us to make a prayer of agreement so that we could all trust God, that God can be able to release a breakthrough. Father, we agree over the nation of Kenya. We say, Lord, during this elective period, as we're about to go into elections, as things are being uh, set in motion, we are commanding peace to reign of our nation. We are also making a declaration that any evil that the enemy may have ordained, planned or purposed, or plotted against our nation in any way, it will not prosper. We uproot every seed of evil planted in the minds of the hearts of men. Every seed of fear that may trigger men into actions that are ungodly. We uproot them in Jesus' name. We make a decree concerning our nation that this nation is secured in God. Father, we pray that God, those that you have appointed, you will mark them with uncommon favor. Those that you have appointed, the ear that will hear them will bless them. The eye that will see them will approve them. We declare that God, you will cause them to succeed in whatever endeavors they will be involved in. Any that is not of God, Father, we pray now in the name of Jesus that God, you will remove any veil of favor. They will not be recognized. You will cut them off in the name of Jesus. We pray against a wave of witchcraft that can manipulate human beings into actions that are ungodly. We rebuke witchcraft and demonic covers over the nation of Kenya. We stand as the ecclesia to agree that God, every county is secure. Even the counties that they call hotspots. We turn them around. We say there will be zones of peace and they will be recognized as zones that are secured by God. We speak to the nation. We say your walls will be called salvation and your gates will be called praise. Within you, Kenya, there will be no violence. Peace will rule for the officers of righteousness will run through your roads and the officers of peace will run through your villages and your streets. In Jesus' name, we decree this. And Father, we thank you because we believe you have heard it. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for joining me. I trust that you have been blessed. Please, if you came in late, you have the opportunity of going ahead and watching this message again. You can even get it on YouTube just not long from now. Watch it over and over and let it be a blessing again. Find time, be a blessing to us as a ministry. Remember again, it will be online throughout tomorrow. I'm back here at 1 o'clock exactly. And we will be blessed again. Tomorrow we are dealing with signs and wonders. You don't want to miss it because it will be miracles breaking forth. God bless you in Jesus' name.